so uh, welcome back after the break so uh, you are uh, proceeding towards the stability analysis of the main amplifier and uh, first of all we decided why to choose capacitive feedback as the uh, as an option for our design so that is dictated by the electrode impedance electrode is having very high impedance therefore we don't want to use r1 r2 as a feedback because it will use very large resistance value and second we also decided what to choose for c2 that is dependent upon the parasitic capacitances so the c2 value is a smaller one it should be significantly larger than the parasitic capacitance values and we are choosing it around 100 femtofarad as a result the c1 may be 50 uh, 5 picofarad for a gain of say 50 now once we have these values uh, we can go back and try to see what is the loop gain a beta coming over here the expression for a beta we have we have written the expression for a we have also seen what is beta beta is just i f upon v out so that is just one upon z f now this is the expression for a and if we just look at the r2 and one upon sc2 so this r2 is going to be maybe uh, ro1 parallel ro2 can be of the order of few mega ohms so around 10 to the power of 7 one upon sc2 on the other hand uh, within the frequency of interest if we talk about say uh, our bandwidth requirement is up to say 100 hertz uh, but we will be going we will see that the bandwidth of the amplifier chosen will be sufficiently higher at least few kilohertz so suppose we are having s of 10 to the power of 3 um, and the c value we have chosen as 100 femtofarad so 10 to the power of 15 so we are having a large number 10 to the power of 10 so uh, as compared to r2 we can uh, as compared to 1 upon sc2 we can ignore r2 and then one of it gets cancelled with the other one upon sc2 on the top so we are left with the remaining expression for the gain a and now the beta factor we know that is one upon zf so that is again another sc2 factor coming over here that cancels another sc2 so the overall a beta is just coming as gm1 r1 gm2 r2 which is the open loop amplifier gain so back to the same point we try to open the loop of this shunt shunt amplifier configuration and looked at the open loop gain so it is coming independent of the capacitive feedback network it's just the open loop gain of the amplifier that we need to analyze for the stability purpose now so our task becomes very simple we are uh, we don't need to consider any feedback element as such for the open loop stability analysis we just need to consider the open loop gain and look at the critical points this is coming from the uh, common mode feedback circuit we have already taken care of it we have analyzed the stability of it and once again here we need to see what are the critical nodes v i plus v i minus so here once again in the signal path we can identify what are the critical nodes or high impedance nodes so we have node x and x dash y and y dash both as the critical node because at both these points we have total small signal impedance given by r o by 2 r o p parallel r o n and therefore we have two significant uh, poles uh, in the circuit and now the strategy that is commonly used to compensate this two stage op amp is to use a miller multiplication for a capacitance connected between the input of the first uh, output of the first stage and the output of the second stage we call it cc and uh, if you try to find out so if you try to find out the equivalent capacitance that between this point and ground coming because of this feed forward connection between the output of point uh, uh, say between point x and y so at point x it is going to be cc times 1 minus a of the second stage that, that is gm2 r2 and at this point the equivalent capacitance so by this is by miller multiplication so this is the c effective you can say at the first stage you can call it c1 so the c1 will be given by cc times 1 uh, plus gmr2 basically is 1 minus a2 
and that comes from the Miller effect that uh, most of us are familiar with. And therefore, it can give us a big boost by using a nominally uh, small value of CC, we can get a effectively large equivalent C1, which can make the node X a dominant pole. So that is the purpose of using CC between the node X and Y. So that is uh, the common strategy to compensate uh, two stage amplifier on both the sides we can have a CC connected uh, and uh, we have an overall uh, pole the dominant pole given by 1 upon R1 times CC where R1 is the total output impedance of the first stage. Uh, if we talk about the gain bandwidth product of the amplifier then gain bandwidth product which is another important quantity generally mentioned for the amplifier specs. So the gain bandwidth product is given by gain which is R1 times GM, GM1, R2 times GM2, this is the overall gain, R1 is the output impedance of the first stage, R2 is the output impedance of the second stage, GM1, GM2, transcorrectances times the bandwidth, bandwidth is dominated by the first, determined by the first dominant pole which is at the first point, so that is just uh, R1 times CC, uh, CC times sorry, uh, approximately GM2 times R2, so here we have R2 times GM2 coming and therefore we can say that the gain bandwidth product is just going to be GM1 upon CC. So uh, the ratio GM1 upon the coupling capacitor determines the gain bandwidth product of the amplifier. <coughs> so uh, in general uh, Let me uh, rather just draw the symbolic version. So here, if we had resistors over here, then possibly we did not have to worry about the biasing. For our device condition is that at the input we have capacitor, so this is basically a capacitor in our case. Out of the circuit, out of the chip, the electrode is presenting us a, a large resistor and a capacitor combination, so we have seen yesterday how to model the electrode. And we just want a large impedance looking into the input node. And in this case, we have uh, selected the value of C. We have selected the feedback capacitor as around, say, 100 femtofarad. And if we need a gain of, say, 50, we can select this as 5 picofarad. So what is the impedance that this 5 picofarad is giving us? 1 upon omega C. So now, if we look at the bandwidth of interest, uh, bandwidth is around up to 100 hertz for the input signal and then we have uh, the input capacitance as 5 picofarad. So uh, if we take away, so around 3.3, this is a large impedance being provided by the input device. Even if we say that the amplifier is supposed to operate at relatively higher frequencies, uh, up to say a kilohertz or few kilohertz, we can take away another factor of 10, still we are uh, going to be comfortably above a mega ohm. So the target was to have a, an input impedance sufficiently higher. So this capacitance of around 5 picofarad is allowing us to have a sufficiently large input impedance. We will talk about the uh, frequency issue a little later. So, uh, so there is a trade-off between the precision of the gain and the capacitor that we can choose. So as I said, uh, for large gain, we need to have a large ratio between these two capacitors. So if uh, we want to have a, a sufficiently large gain, the input capacitance for a chosen feedback capacitance needs to be large, but if we go for too high capacitance, the input impedance will reduce. So uh, that will force us to choose a, a smaller value of 
the feedback capacitor. And once again, if you choose smaller value of the feedback capacitor, it can uh, reduce the accuracy of the gain because the smaller capacitor will be less precise. It will be more difficult to match it with the uh, input capacitor. So far, so good. So we are still having only capacitive connectivities. So basically, if I look at the actual circuit, we are just having capacitive connection between the output and the input. And that does not give us any DC path. That does not give us any DC bias condition for the input. Input is still uh, not having any DC bias. To do that, uh, we can take the advantage of the DC bias already available at the output node. So we already have establish the DC bias at the output node with the help of common mode feedback. So why not use that common mode feedback to generate a DC bias at the input? That's what we are going to do. We are just directly going to use the common mode uh, available at the output to bias the input. And how to do that? Just by using a large resistor, which is going to provide DC path between the input and the output. So we have these capacitors. Along with them, we connect very large feedback resistors just for the biasing purpose. We call it RB. So their purpose is just to provide, just to have a DC connection between the output and the input branch. So that if we look at the DC condition, if we simulate it for DC condition, these two nodes will be shorted. And as a result, the input will be having same DC point as the output. But now, the overall transfer function is no longer C2 upon C1. It is having RB in parallel. Looks like a high pass filter. So let us uh, find out what is the transfer function and also try to see uh, what should be the appropriate value of RB required in our application. So here we have uh, some Z over here. So the overall transfer function is again going to be Z2 upon Z1, where Z2 is this, Z1 is this. So we can just write down Z2 as RB1 upon SC1 upon RB plus 1 upon SC1 upon Z1, which is just SC2. And once again, we have RB times SC2, 1 plus RB SC1. SC2 upon 1 plus RB SC1. So this is the overall transfer function we are getting now in presence of this RB. Let me write it once again clearly. RB SC2 1 plus RB SC1. Now here once again if we go for, this is acting like a high pass filter. So if you go for sufficiently large frequency such that RB SC1 is much greater than 1, we can ignore this one and we get the same transfer function. C2 upon C1 that we are targeting. That is the gain. So at higher frequency, we are getting the desired C2 upon C1 gain. But that is happening if S is much, much greater than 1 upon RB C1. So basically, we have a pole over here, 1 upon RB C1. And below that, if we go much lower than 1 upon RB C1, that means this term becomes much smaller than 1, and we are having a 20 dB per decade slope. The gain goes down. So high pass filter. Now, here, what should be the cutoff frequency limit? So we have seen the signal bandwidth is, it can be from 0.5 hertz to 100 hertz. So the lower limit definitely must be accommodating that 0.5 hertz. So we can set this RBC1 to around 0.5 hertz into 2 pi. That is going to determine the value of RB required. Now C1 we have already seen. That is, we have chosen it around 100 femtofarad. So the RB is going to be 1 upon 0.5 into 2 pi into 100 femtofarad. That is 10 to the power of 13. So we can see that the required value of RB is coming huge, 10 to the power of 12 ohms. And 
if we choose C1 smaller, again, it can shoot up. So this can be very impractical to implement using actual passive resistances. Using actual passive resistance is almost impossible to implement such a large value on chip. So we need to use some other techniques to implement this RB for the purpose of biasing the uh, input terminal of the amplifier. Another important issue that uh, we want to notice is we are having a 20 dB per decade slope over here and if we are trying to satisfy the condition that this high pass pole is um, at say 0.5 hertz and we also discuss that the artifact or the uh, low frequency DC offset can be sitting 0.1 hertz or below. Now the signal content of EEG is from 0.5 hertz to 100 hertz. So, and uh, we argued that it may be possible to filter out the low frequency content, but the separation between these two signals like the 0.5 boundary, 0.5 hertz boundary for the EEG and the spectrum of the uh, offset which is below 0.5 hertz is too close. So if this is at 0.5 hertz and we want to separate out signals below 0.1 hertz, this is a very small gap and with a 20 dB per decade slope, we are not going to get even a decade uh, separation between these two and hence uh, this 20 dB per decade slope may not be able to suppress a much larger offset signal which is sitting in the vicinity of say this 0.5 hertz corner, right. So we know that the offset signal is much larger as compared to the input signal and uh, as a result even if there is a small drop in gain from here to here, we are going half the decade, so 10 dB drop is there in gain but the actual signal is much, the, the unwanted signal is much larger in amplitude and sitting very close here. Therefore, it is very difficult to separate it using just this single pole high pass function. Therefore, we need to take care of it by using some additional feedback technique which will come in the form of servo loop that we will uh, uh, see a little later. Now, uh, any question before we proceed? Now, we have uh, encountered a problem, we have encountered a problem that the RB value required is coming too huge. So one may say that okay, let us go for larger value of C1, that will reduce the value of RB required, at least little bit. But again the problem is that if you use larger C1, the C2 required will be larger and if C2 required is larger, the input impedance is also going to reduce. So again there is a fight, we cannot really resolve it just by choosing a larger value of C1. So we are forced to use certain alternate techniques. So there are several different uh, ways in which people have tried to realize these high values impedances. One of them I am just uh, drawing over here, using subthreshold region transistors. So this is a node X and Y. So these are the points X and Y across which I am connecting these two PMOS transistors. They are relatively longer channel devices and we know that regarding the DC condition, what, what is the condition we have chosen? We have, we are trying to bias the node X and Y at the same DC point. So if there is a large resistor, it is supposed to provide the same DC condition. There is no other DC path for the input point over here. So it is going to gradually provide, gradually set up the same DC value over here as it is available at Y. So under, if, if I assume that the, under nominal conditions, the signal magnitude suppose is sufficiently low. Now right now in our actual design, our signal magnitude is not very low. We have seen that the dynamic offset can be huge. But suppose we have taken care of the dynamic offset using a servo loop that we will discuss soon. So in that case, at least the input signal over here 
can be low once we have removed once we have addressed the issue of the dynamic offset in that case once again since the gain of the first stage is not so high you will have a certain swing over here your input signal is uh, around 10 to 100 micro volt and as a result the output signal will be 50 times that so uh, 5 millivolt but still as compared to the dc conditions as compared to the threshold voltage of these pmos the overall swing over here is very small across these two devices so we can say that they are these two potentials are lying very close together provided we have taken care of the offset if not if the offset is present then of course you can have a huge signal over here and a huge amplification over here and then you are having a large voltage drop across these two devices so as long as we assume that these two voltages are close together this configuration of cross coupled pmos transistor is going to provide us huge values of resistances let us see how so if i assume that voltage over here is constant and the voltage here is increasing it is uh, having a positive cycle so suppose input side is you know going to be 50 times smaller than the output side so we can assume that this is fixed this guy is either going up or down depending upon you know small fluctuation in the input so we can say that the x side is fixed y side we are having some swing and as a result of this small swing what is the operation status of this pmos transistors so for the positive cycle when the output signal y is going higher what is the condition of these two devices so let me call it m1 call it m2 for m1 y is higher in potential so of course this is going to be the source for the positive cycle for uh, the y for the m1 your source signal is significantly higher is going slightly higher than the gate signal right the gate is x the source is going higher so m1 can start turning on nominally if these two voltage were exactly same then vgs vsg was ideally zero the transistors were strongly off and the off resistance of the transistor can be pretty high if you choose the channel length to be large that is the main condition so if we are keeping x and y same then under those conditions the vsg of both these devices is zero and if we choose sufficiently large channel length we can have very huge impedances coming in there will be some leakage current right there is a small leakage current even in the off state and that leakage current is giving us that huge amount of resistance maybe 10 to the power of 10 11 12 depending upon the channel length if you use large channel length even then you can have some minute leakage current even if the vsg is zero so because of that leakage we can still get some finite resistance uh, it is not uh, ideal switch an ideal switch has infinite off impedance and zero on resistance whereas in case of a mosfet you have finite uh, on resistance even if it is completely fully on like a digital switch and it also has non zero uh, sorry uh, uh, finite uh, off resistance because of the leakage current so we are taking advantage of the leakage to achieve very high impedances under nominal condition we expect that the two mosfets are off and they are providing very high impedances just there is some small leakage current flowing which is over the time going to set the dc condition over here now if the signal over here is going positive the for the mosfet m1 we see that there is a positive vsg coming and that can exponentially reduce the impedance of the pmos so we know that in sub threshold regime the current is exponentially dependent upon vsg so even a very small few millivolts of increase in vsg can cause huge roll off in resistance it can drastically reduce the resistance very quickly so we see that the vsg is experiencing a positive vsg uh, sorry uh, m1 is pro, uh, experiencing a positive vsg and hence its, its impedance can come down but now it is series connected to m2 this cross point is not really having any connection so the connections are only at this point where i have drawn the dots so these are just wires going across from this point to this point now m1 is in trouble but what about m2 what is the condition of m2 so for m2 what is the source under this condition once again y is higher than x so we expect this point to be higher than x so once again this is the source for m2 and the gate of m2 is higher than the source of m2 the potential of 
the gate of M2 is still higher than the potential at the source of M2. So in that case, what is going to happen? The impedance of M2 is going to go up. Earlier, if X and Y were same, both of them were off. Now, if Y is going up, M1 is getting on because the source of M1 is becoming more positive than the gate of M1, but M2 is becoming more strongly off, right? Because the gate of M2 is becoming more positive than the source of M2. Therefore, it is becoming even more strongly off. Therefore, the series resistance, since it is dominated by the uh, combination of M1 and M2, it will remain high. It will still provide a very high resistance. So, despite this fluctuation over one end, it is going to provide us a flat, uh, you know, uh, even if the, if you plot this curve V uh, X minus V Y, for a su su sufficiently wide range across the zero point, we get a flat resistance because of this property. So, so same thing happens on the other side. If the input signal is suppose uh, going slightly higher as a result, output is going down. So in that case, in the down cycle, the same phenomena gets reversed. The M2 will be getting on, but M1 will become even more strongly off. So once again, it keeps the balance and for a sufficiently wide region, at least uh, uh, 100 millivolt or so, or larger than that, in fact, we have seen, it remains flatter. And then you can choose an appropriate value by sizing the transistor, so it depends upon the channel length, first of all. And there are some other techniques, some biasing techniques through which you can lower it also, it can be made tunable. So uh, values even up to 10 to the power of 14 have been demonstrated in literature. Uh, and it can be tunable within the range 10 to the power of 14 to 10 to the power of 8. So a very wide tuning range can be obtained. One of the disadvantages of this scheme is that it is not very robust with respect to temperature, process, etc. So as the temperature changes, the threshold voltage changes quite a bit. And that can also cause a good amount of variation over here. So generally, uh, there can be techniques to compensate for that. For example, there can be switch capacitor implementation. You can imp realize this kind of resistors using switch capacitors also. Uh, uh, so there are different, different techniques people use. So depending upon how much precision do we want over here, we can, uh, if the precision requirement is not too high, we have uh, a process which is giving us relatively less variation, uh, less spread in the R off value. We can comfortably use these devices in the feedback path. So uh, we have to remember that what happens if, if, if by chance the resistance gets lowered, then this pole is going to shift up. And if, if it shifts up, then we are going to miss some, part, some spectrum of our desired signal because it has to be, at least it has to pass the 0.5 hertz corner. So if R reduces over temperature, it will shift up and then we will start losing the lower end of the spectrum. So we have to be careful about choosing the R, make it robust enough. Any question? So this is about the DC bias of the input side. So, so we have uh, taken care of the uh, biasing condition, we have taken care of the sizing. Now, the next uh, important issue that we need to address is uh, noise analysis, which also has impact on sizing, significant impact on sizing. So, uh, let us, uh, you know, start the discussion on noise. So I already have some pre-prepared uh, notes. I can just use those in the beginning. Generally, when I prepare notes ahead of time, my handwriting are better. If I do it here, it is a little bit, uh, you know, deplorable. So here uh, we have already, I guess, uh, gone through the concepts of noise analysis while uh, studying RF circuits. 
especially the design of LNA, where uh, all of us might have come across um, the concept of noise in circuits and uh, uh, concepts like noise spectral density, how to do the noise analysis in a, a given CMOS circuit, etc. So once, uh, just a, a very brief recap of that. Any question before we proceed? So, noise, uh, electrical noise can be treated as a random signal and different noise sources can have different distribution for that uh, absolutely uh, randomly fluctuating signals. Some of them can have Gaussian distribution, some of them can have 1 upon F distribution, some of them can have, uh, you know, completely white noise. So, uh, the spectrum, the frequency spectrum of this signal can be uh, Thus, uh, can be source dependent. In general, if we want to express the energy content in the noise, we can take the RMS value of such a small randomly fluctuating electrical signal by squaring the average of the signal over a sufficiently long duration and dividing it by that period of the integration. So, this is the definition of RMS value of the noise. So, although noise is an aperiodic signal, completely random, so one of the way to quantize it is to look at the RMS value. What is the RMS value of a, a particular noisy signal? So, if you take the mean of this signal, of course, it is going to be 0. Mean of a completely random signal will be 0. But the root mean square value, we can find out by um, taking the square of the signal over time, integrating it over a large duration t, sufficiently large duration t, and then uh, dividing by t and taking the square root. RMS value is important because power dissipated by a particular signal can be found out by the RMS value. So, if we assume that there is a noise source whose RMS value we have found out, V and RMS by this process, we can find out the power delivered by that source to a 1 ohm resistor just by saying V square upon R because in order to do the power computation, we will do the follow the same thing. So, power dissipation can be expressed in the form of the RMS value of the noise. That's what it is done over here, V square upon R. That's why the uh, mean square value of the noise becomes an important quantity because it quantifies the overall power, overall energy it can deliver to a 1 ohm load. Now, if we talk about superposition of two noisy signals and then try to find out the power delivered by this summation. So, here I have added two noisy signals Vn1 and Vn2t. They are completely random signal independent of each other. Their individual means are going to be 0. Each of them are going to have some RMS value Vn1 RMS, Vn2 RMS, which we can find out like this. And in time domain, we are just adding them together and then try to find out the RMS value by measuring the power this combination delivers to a 1 ohm load. So, once again I can apply the same process, I can add this to in time domain, take the square, integrate over a long time 0 to t, divided by t, that gives me the V square RMS of the output voltage. That is what is written over here. Now, if we just open this square, we can take the individuals out of it, V1 square RMS, V2 square RMS and then we are left with, because if, if I just uh, take V and 1 square T out of it, then we are having 1 upon T, 0 to T, V and 1 square T, DT, 0 to T, that is going to give me the V1, V and 1 square RMS. Likewise, the second term V and 2 square T integrated over the time T divided by T, V and 2 square RMS and then we are left with the correlation term and correlation between two completely random terms, stochastic terms is going to be 0 over a long time. So, this term vanishes, this is 0. So, we are just left with V1 square RMS, Vn2 square RMS. So, the output RMS value of this combination is going to be V1 square, V2 square. So, in order to add the effect of two completely independent noise sources, we need to add the mean square values of those noise sources rather than adding the noise amplitude. So, if we have been given that the uh, mean square value 
or the uh, RMS value of one source is VN1, RMS value of another source is VN2 and these two sources are completely independent. The RMS value of the combined source will be root under V1 square plus V2 square. This is what we have to take care of when we are combining the noise of different uncorrelated sources in a circuit. Now, another uh, important representation or uh, way of quantification of noise is the power spectral density of noise. So, the power spectral density can be defined as the energy content of the noise in a unit bandwidth at a particular frequency F naught. And uh, the other two things like the chopper stabilization and the servo loop can be taken care tomorrow. So, at least the noise concept and the noise analysis for a single stage amplifier we need to finish over here. All right, so let us continue. Any question? Yes, sir. Could you please throw some light on a level translator used in OPAM? Level? Huh? Level translator. Level, level translator, shifter. If you are, that is just a common drain buffer that if you require a different level than the output, suppose you are, uh, or in case you need to buffer the signal, you need to use the common drain which can either shift up or down uh, the signal depending on whether you use a PMOS device or an NMOS device. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, let us try to finish the discussion on noise and a small example on noise analysis of a uh, differential pair that we have worked on so that we can make some conclusions regarding the uh, sizing of the transistors based on noise. So, we are talking about noise spectral density, another important way, another important matrix to quantify the noise and for a particular source conceptually how do we measure the noise spectral density? So, we pass the noise signal through a filter, a sh very sharp band pass filter of bandwidth delta f. Suppose it is just a thought experiment and then supply the signal to a 1 ohm load and then measure the power delivered to this 1 ohm load. And for a particular bandwidth, we can divide this power by delta f. So, that gives me the energy content per unit frequency per unit bandwidth at a particular F naught. So, once again I repeat, I pass the signal to be quantified through a band pass filter with a very narrow bandwidth delta F, pass that signal to the 1 ohm load, measure the uh, power delivered which gives me the mean square value of the signal, divide by the delta F that gives me the energy content per unit bandwidth of the noise at that F naught which is the center frequency of this band pass filter. So, that gives me at a particular F naught what is the mean square value per unit bandwidth that is V n square per hertz on the y axis. And then I shift keep shifting the F naught and keep repeating the experiment for all F naught and get all these different different points and then finally get the overall noise spectral density. So, this is the noise power spectral density because it is giving me how the power of the noise source is distributed over frequency. So, at a particular F naught, if I look at the magnitude of this noise spectral density, it is going to tell me at this particular frequency, if I choose a particular bandwidth delta F in that, what is the noise power content. Generally, people also express the same quantity by taking the square root of this plot. So, that becomes the unit along the y axis in that case becomes volt per root hertz. So, here we have v square volt square per hertz for the power spectral density of the noise. Take the root and it becomes y volts per root hertz and this is called the root power spectral density of the noise. So, this is the way to quantify a particular noise source. So, we need to talk about the elements that we are going to use in circuits. Ideal inductors and capacitors, they do not have noise. Whatever noise is present in capacitors or inductors, that is because of the passive resistances in the actual resistors and capacitors. So, in simulations, if you are using ideal capacitor resistors, they do not contribute to any noise. A resistor has a thermal noise 
and the source of the thermal noise is the random motion of the electrons, thermally excited electrons, and that gives us an equivalent noise voltage or the sp uh, spectral density of the volt noise voltage as 4 kTr. So, this is Vr square f, that is the noise power spectral density as the frequency of f, uh, as frequency f for a resistor is 4 kTr, that means it is a white noise, it is independent of frequency. For all frequencies, the power spectral density of the noise of a resistor is 4 kTr, flat spectrum. For all frequencies, you have the same energy component. I can also uh, express this as an equivalent power spectral density for the current, noise current for the resistor by dividing this V square upon uh, R square. So, that gives me the equivalent power spectral density of the noise current in the resistor, 4 kT upon R. So, depending upon the uh, situation, whether my resistor is contributing a current to the uh, input or whether it is uh, you know, uh, coming in series with an input voltage, we can use either equivalent noise voltage or equivalent noise current for the resistor. Next, we have the MOSFET for which once again, uh, you might have already seen the two major noise sources are the flicker noise, which is given by K, which is a constant upon W L C O X times F. So, this is having one upon F dependency. So, this is called 1 upon f noise also commonly. It is having inverse dependency on the area and also capacitance. It happens because of random fluctuation of electrons and their uh, transport across the oxide and trapping in the oxide. So, as these electrons are accelerating in the channel, some of them get injected into the insulating region and as a result, there is a uh, significant fluctuation in the threshold voltages over here. And as a result of that, we have an effective thermal noise coming at the gate. So, we can look at it as an effective change in threshold voltage or effectively we can present it as a series voltage coming in uh, series with the gate terminal. So, as the frequency increases, these signals, these transport of electrons, they drop. So, generally this is a low frequency phenomena. So, if you are talking about higher frequencies, the electrons, the trapping and detrapping of electrons in these oxide region happens to be a relatively slower phenomena. Therefore, their content at higher frequency is really limited. As a result, the frequency spectrum of this noise originating from the trapping, detrapping of electrons in the oxide region, that leads to a spectrum which is increasing with 1 upon f. The content is higher at lower frequencies. Likewise, C O x, it is having a term epsilon O x upon T O x. So, if the T O x is larger, the 1 upon f noise is larger once again, because if you are having trapping and detrapping of electrons in this oxide, a larger T O x means a lo longer integration. So, if there is a charge trapped at a particular surface and because of that you have an electric field originating in the perpendicular direction, you integrate over a longer direction that uh, longer uh, distance if you have a larger oxide thickness and that means integrating the field of the trapped charge over longer distance leading to a larger change in voltage and hence a larger noise magnitude. So, that means longer oxide thickness is going to give you larger 1 upon f noise and hence 1 upon C O x dependence. If you have larger area, then generally these are statistical phenomena. So, they average out over a larger area. So, as you go on increasing the area, we get an overall averaging phenomena and hence the mean square value reduces and hence we have W and L dependency. So, this is sums up the exp uh, expression for the 1 upon f noise. The second component is the thermal noise current, which is represented by a parallel channel current, parallel current as I d square and that is just like a thermal noise coming from a resistor. So, if I assume that the effective resistance of this MOSFET when it is in on condition is 1 upon g m. So, I am writing something like 4 k t upon r, just like we have for the resistor. So, this is just because of the thermal noise of the on resistance of this MOSFET. This 
2 by 3 is generally a uh, constant 4 kt gamma gm. Gm can uh, be empirically determined from experiments and it varies from technology to technology as well. So, so if you want to represent the total noise at the input of the MOSFET, we can reflect this channel current to the input as well by dividing this ID square by GM square because this is something analogous to the channel current, the small signal channel current of the MOSFET, right? So you have a small signal gate voltage VGS, the channel current flowing from drain to source becomes GM times VGS and therefore I can derive an equivalent input voltage which can capture the effect of this noise current in the channel by dividing this ID square by GM square. That's what is done over here. So we have the 1 upon F noise already at the gate. We added to it the effect of this channel current by dividing this ID square by GM square and hence we get the total VI square F at the gate of the MOSFET as 4 kT gamma 1 upon GM plus the original 1 upon F noise. So th we can say this is the overall input referred noise of the isolated MOSFET. Remember that we can do this only this uh, translation we can do only if the source is grounded because in that case I can say that if you have a small signal VG coming over here VG times GM will be equal to this current. If it is not grounded if it is connected to some other transistors then this translation is not valid. We will see uh, in some examples in, uh, the condition when this is connected to some other transistors how to uh, uh, account for this uh, transistors. Now once we have seen the uh, basic components of the noise let us see how to uh, apply the noise analysis in a circuit. Let us straight go to the amplifier circuit that we have uh, used in our main design. Uh, so this is the very first stage of the amplifier we used in building our front end, ampli uh, front end uh, uh, amplifier and as we have seen the noise of the first stage is the most crucial one. So if we are able to make it low noise uh, we can uh, be sure uh, that the overall noise figure of the uh, two stage amplifier is going to be low. So here the simple thing we are going to do is we are going to represent, we are going to add the noise source at the gate of each of these MOSFET. So these are the equivalent noise sources, the input referred noise sources of these MOSFETs. So if you see for the differential mode operation, this node is an AC ground. So therefore we can afford to translate the noise current source coming in parallel with M1 and M2 to the gate. That is why we have been able to translate it to the gate of M1 and M2 although the source is not grounded. For M5, M3 and M4 there is no problem, their sources are grounded therefore the channel current can be comfortably translated to the gates. And now we have these uh, sources available, we, the only thing that we need to do is find out the effect of each of these individual sources on the total, on the output VO plus and VO minus. Now all these sources are uncorrelated, noise of each of these five transistors they are uncorrelated. Therefore when we add, we need to add their output power. So here we are going to find out the power spectral density at the output resulting from each of these noise sources and then add them all together. We cannot add the magnitudes, we cannot add the noise directly but their power needs to be figured out. What about, so first of all let us see what happens to the noise of M5, what is the contribution of M5 um, on the overall output noise. So I will not finish this analysis, I will just give a starting point and then you know complete the analysis possibly you know tomorrow f uh, as we have agreed for a e morning session after con consulting with the technical staff over here I will uh, just let you know. So what is the role of the noise at the gate of M5? So if I look at it, it is providing a common mode signal to the two branches, right? So a noise, so 
source placed over here, it is going to provide you noise current which is going to be divided equally between these two. So, if I talk about the noise contribution coming to the output because of M5, both these outputs will be equivalent. They will be half in magnitude as compared to the noise current over here. And both these components are going to be correlated. The noise current coming here because of the noise current of M5, they are correlated because they are coming from the same source. And as a result, when we take the signal differentially, they get subtracted and we get uh, no effect of the noise of M5. This is clear? So, the noise of M5 divided equally in these two channels, whatever noise current you are having in M5 divided equally in these two channels, they are correlated, therefore, they, we can take their difference. What we just saw is that for random sources, we cannot add or subtract the noise amplitude, we need to sub add their power. But because these two are correlated, they are coming from the same transistor, we can just subtract them while we are taking the signal differentially. So, that is another advantage of a fully differential circuit. The noise contribution of the tail current transistors that is almost mitigated, that is not coming into picture because it is uh, disappearing because of the fully differential operation. Whereas, for the other transistors, we need to evaluate how these noise sources attached to the gate of other transistors, they are influencing the total output. So, once again that requires a similar small signal analysis for the differential mode and we can find out what is the total output noise coming up. So, for each of them we need to find out, for example, during half circuit we need to look at the total noise voltage over here coming because of V in 1 and the noise voltage coming because of V in 4 and then add the their total power. Likewise, at the other node, these two noise sources they are uncorrelated. Therefore, when we take their difference, we cannot write directly subtract them and nullify them. There we need to add their overall power spectral density when we are considering the differential operation. So, once again, for the noise sources of M1, M2, M3, M4, the total contribution of the output at these two points will be added together even if we are taking the signal output differentially because they are uncorrelated sources we need to add the power spectral density. So, this is I am leaving it uh, at this point, uh, we will finish the small signal analysis for the noise and also the discussion on uh, chopper stabilization uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, any question? <coughs>